Hi, good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name's Richard Martin. I'm Director of Education and Public Programs here at the Whitechapel Gallery. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to our discussion this evening, Making Spaces, which is presented in partnership with the Architecture Foundation. It's great to see you here in our auditorium and a warm welcome to those of you joining our live stream. So here at the Whitechapel, we've been thinking a lot about studios recently, about how artists have utilized and satirized and reimagined these semi-mythic spaces. And you can see a dizzying range of representations and recreations of studio life by an international array of artists in our current exhibition, A Century of the Artist Studio, which runs here until early June. And you can make your own artistic masterpiece in the living studio, which is a participatory space adjacent to the exhibition, filled with inspiring objects and materials. Running alongside the exhibition here, our friends at the Architecture Foundation have developed a brilliant series of conversations and films exploring the rich typology of artist studios and the contemporary challenges of delivering studio provision. You can see those presentations on the Architecture Foundation's YouTube channel, and there's a link to them on the event page for tonight's discussion. But with all of this in mind, how might we assess the provision of studios and other creative spaces in our cities today? What role can architects, urban designers, and civic and community organizations play in creating and supporting artistic practices? What new, innovative, and equitable models of studio provision are emerging? And of course, how has the pandemic reshaped the opportunities and the obstacles for making creative spaces? We have a terrific lineup of panelists with us tonight to help us consider these vital, complex questions. We're joined by the architect, Astrid Smitham, co-founder of the East London Practice Apparata, whose work has particularly focused on the provision of community and cultural spaces. Their projects include the Old Manor Park Library in Newham, and most recently, a house for artists, also in Newham, which combines low rent housing with studio provision and a community art center. And you may also have seen Apparata's work here at the Whitechapel Gallery as part of the group exhibition, Is This Tomorrow? in 2017. Joining Astrid is Eve Blay, who is operations manager at the Creative Land Trust, which is an organization founded to tackle the lack of affordable space for artists and other cultural workers in London and beyond. Eve has worked at the Trust since its inception five years ago, manages the property portfolio, and is currently leading the tendering process and the fit out for new spaces in Hackney and Newham. There's lots happening in Newham recently, as we can see. And our discussion this evening is chaired by Holly Lewis, who in 2006 co-founded We Made That, an award-winning practice of architects, urban designers, and researchers. We made that work exclusively for the public sector and charities with offices in London and Manchester. And Holly and the team have received particular acclaim for the thoughtful, imaginative and ethical way that they've approached working with urban communities. And amongst everything else, Holly is also a national high street task force expert, the mayor's design advocate for the GLA and a design council built environment expert. We're thrilled to have Holly, Eve, and Astrid with us tonight, and I want to thank all of them for taking the time from their busy schedules to join us. And I want to thank Alice Woodman and the team at the Architecture Foundation for their wonderful collaboration on tonight's events and the related series of films. Our panelists will share and discuss ideas supported by some images um, for about an hour. And then there will be a chance for you to ask questions and to join the conversation. And we ask if you could wait for the microphone to reach you at that crucial moment. That would be especially appreciated so that our online audiences can also hear your contribution. We'll finish here in the auditorium about half past eight, but our bookshop and our exhibitions here are open until nine o'clock this evening. Lastly, um, I'd like to remind you that if you're comfortable and able to wear a face mask in our auditorium, we'd encourage you to do so. 
that's all from me. Thank you all so much for coming, and I hope you enjoy the evening. And please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Astrid Smitham, to Eve Blaze, and first of all, to Holly Lewis. Thanks very much, Richard, for a really great introduction and actually doing all of my work for me. So I don't have to do any of the introduction to you guys because everybody already knows who you are. Um, and thanks for joining. Uh, I think we're going to have a really interesting conversation. We've already started, if I'm being honest, in the session before. Um, so I'm really interested to hear from both Astrid and Eve about their various experiences and to, I guess, draw out some of our learning as well. So just by way of a little bit of introduction, we made that have been thinking about artist studios in London specifically um, for quite a long time. We first did a study in 2014, mapping artist workspace across the city. We updated that in 2017, and we're just in the process of updating again now that kind of evidence base. So I'll be chucking in some findings from that as we go through. Um, but I think let's just get stuck in. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a little bit of a presentation from each, Astrid and Eve. Astrid, I think you're going first, just to talk yep. us a bit through your work. Um, so I'll just hand over to you. OK, thanks. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Astrid Smithen, architect and co-founder of Apparata. So we work closely with artists both in collaborations and creating studio space and living space for artists. So we're interested in ideas around what you fix in place when you build something and what you leave open. So we try to design for uh, unknown futures and that means we, we try to design for spaces that can host many things rather than just one and uh, allow for uh, built-in adaptability and ways to use space differently. So I'm going to introduce three projects that we've worked on. The first is Manor Park Library. So this was a reused project to create a studio space and public space in a former Carnegie Library. Uh, then called Old Manor Park Library. Sorry. This is the um, uh, the street facing library room in the 90s. There was a timber and glass partition that was typical of Edwardian buildings, uh, which uh, is a, a device that both connects and divides spaces. Uh, this is how it looked when we got hold of it. The glass and timber arch had gone. The building had been left empty for several years and was starting to uh, rot, a lot of damp issues. So the uh, brief was to create a public space at the front and studios at the middle and the back, but the public had to be able to access amenities at the back. So the public had to be able to cross a private secure studio area. So it was this... Uh, physical crossover suggested that those studios would be more public. And typically these types of conversions would be a narrow plasterboard corridor uh, that uh, diminish a connection between visitors and artists. So we reinstated the glass and timber arch and extended the glass and timber partitioning to create a large light common room that could be used for working, for shared meals, for children to store their coats when there's an event on. Uh, it became a central meeting place for the artists in the building and between the artists and the local community. So it also has built-in flexibility that if you rent uh, a five square meter studio, because perhaps that's what you can afford, you can expand into a 40 square meter space if you need to. So we believe that the public and community spaces deserve the best possible workmanship and materials and quality to respect community uh, and that public spaces shouldn't speak of austerity. This is the common room. Uh, we think any shared spaces should be pleasant places to reside so that chance encounters are more likely and, and happen in a place where you can stay and make meaningful connections. The studios are transparent, so the whole plan receives daylight, uh, but you can also hang up boards to modify the privacy levels. So these studios attracted artists that already had a more public practice, and the partitions were used for display. And they suited artists that wanted a strong connection to the public space, uh, and that might form part of their practice. So this is Rabbits Road Institute, led by resident artists and uh, Create London. And upstairs, there were more private studios to suit artists with other needs. Uh, 
each studio had a smooth wall and a structured one uh, that could be used for storage. The next project is the White House, a former farmhouse on the Beckentree estate in Dagenham. It's an estate that has many wonderful aspects, but also lacks community spaces or amenities. It's a type of urban planning that presupposes certain roles for men and women and a certain family structure. And from the outset, it had rules against working in the home. So in this setting, the White House is a project about celebrating domestic space as a place of artistic production. The idea is that the building is a house, it's a home for two resident artists, and it's also a public art space and a place of work. So it's spent time as an age concern uh, before being left empty for many years. So again, suffering from damp and drop. This is the connection to the garden. So when we took over the building, uh, it had a lot of partitions, uh, a corridor with separate cul-de-sac rooms. We stripped the building out and added cuts that restored the connectivity that was more typical of a farmhouse when the building would have been used for working and living. And that allowed for different through routes and different configurations for events. Each room took on the role of uh, a room in a house, a living room, dining room, front room, kitchen, while simultaneously being public facing studios. And the artists decide how often the house would be public. Upstairs the rooms become gradually more private with semi-private studios and then fully private bedrooms. So these are the most public rooms. The new connection to the garden. The dining room, which is also a workshop. And then these are some of the different activities. Shared meals, drama rehearsals, tea and cake, or painting class. And that's just a few of the activities. And then as you go upstairs, it becomes more private. The studios and then the bedrooms. So the last project is one we've completed recently, which is the House for Artists uh, in, Dag in Barking. And that was uh, for Create London, Be First, and London Borough of Barking Dagenham, and the GLA. So this combines places for artists to live and to work, as well as public art space. It's close to an extremely active high street. The empty plot is uh, the site. And it's uh, on the site of a former post-war estate that was demolished. And there's a new housing estate made up of blocks and uh, pitched roof houses. So a priority for us was to design for agency through the inherent properties of the building itself. And by that, we mean how much agency the occupants have over the space when the build is finished and into the future. Uh, and we think that agency has to be built into the floor plan uh, and into the construction details, as well as into the agreements that the occupants sign when uh, that allow them to have ownership over the spaces. And that's even if they're renting temporarily. So the walls, uh, they're patras, so you can drill into them um, and you can hang things from the ceiling, you can move the kitchen. And we wanted the plan to be inherently adaptable in a way that apartments seldom are. So the plan shows a walkway to the north and to the south. That means there's a direct fire escape from every room. And that means that the plan is free to, uh, for, to have rooms uh, or walls added and removed. There's no central corridor taking up space. So there's some variations that you could have just two large rooms, uh, a two bed family apartment, or you can split that living space to create a working space or reconfigure the shape of the apartment plan to have a shoot through room. So, okay. so while we wanted to allow for agency and adaptability, we still have to operate within norms. And uh, as a result, the apartments, they don't exceed national space standards, but by not having a corridor, you, the apartments feel much bigger. And you can use that space to add a room. So if you 
have another child, you um, need to make a studio, or you want to, you have, there's someone that you need to care for, you can adapt to those unknown futures. And people don't have to constantly make changes, but it's the adaptability is there if you need it, so that's the same space with a room added. And this is the shared walkway. This can be furnished. Uh, that was worked out with the fire strategy early on, and that was so that it could be a meaningful communal space where people could work or have meals together. And you know, the windows are positioned at a height where the sill can also become a seat. So on one floor, there's an optional form of co-housing where people can open the double doors in the party wall and when they're closed, they perform acoustically like a party wall. Uh, this can be used for shared practices between artists as a way of multiplying the space that they have to work in. Or they can be used for shared childcare or it can be used for extended family living models that go beyond the idea of a nuclear family. We wanted the building to read as a public building and have presence against the many towers that are that are near the building um, with a legible stack tectonic and also playful shapes that indicate where other functions are taking place. The triangular form here allows for a double height studio. The concrete is 50% GGBS and is a single skin which is structural. So this means there's no doubling up of heavy materials so the overall carbon actually comes in below the REBA 2030 target. So we thought of the public space as essentially capturing part of the street, that the building is set back to create a wider pavement than previously. There are covered areas where people can shelter from the rain and the idea is you can see what's happening before you go in, so there's a lower threshold to entry. So the ground floor will be programmed by the artists that are living there and they then get 65% of market rate for their rent. And the final layout of the ground floor is currently being worked out with the artists. So there will be some partitions and we'll, we'll be working on that with them for the next few months. So, uh, Always the plans were thought of in terms of where you can work, whether it's public facing or shared studio or private studio, uh, shared spaces in the apartments, function neutral rooms. So you can decide if you bring a guest to your apartment, whether you're bringing them to a studio space or to a living space or something ambiguous. So here's some of the other spaces, the double height space, or an outdoor space high up. So for us, these projects are all linked, like part of a, an ongoing work into topics of art and community, um, each specific to their location, but connected. And it's about how to allow for generosity and agency within a regulatory economic and constructural norms that don't necessarily always welcome that. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Astrid. I think it's really great to kind of see behind some of those images, which are familiar and that we definitely look at often. Um, so thank you. Eve, shall we come to you next to talk yeah. about something a bit less architectural and yeah. a bit of something else? I haven't got quite so many designs in my presentation. There's a lot of slides. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Eve Blay. I'm the operations manager at Creative Land Trust. Uh, we're an organization, quite a young organization, that was set up uh, to protect affordable workspace in perpetuity in London. Um, we are supported by the Mayor of London, Arts Council England, Bloomberg Philanthropies, and Outset Contemporary Art Fund. And we were set up off the back of a number of studies that came out, um, I suppose, over the last eight years, uh, namely by the Arts Council and the Greater London Authority. Um, one in particular actually is the one that Holly was mentioning earlier, the Artists' Workspace Study, um, which 
um, surveyed the uh, landscape of uh, studios across London in 2014 and 2017 and uh, showed that of the 11,500 studios in London, approximately, um, only a very small percentage, about 13% of them, were um, owned in freehold and secured which meant that the rest uh, were um, at the mercy of increasing rents, as, as rents do in London, uh, and short-term leases, which sometimes come to an end, and then therefore the um, studios have to shut, which means that the spaces that are left were becoming more and more unaffordable. Um, so really the way to try and combat that, um, it was thought was to create an entity that could take on freeholds and uh, provide space in perpetuity. Um, you may know the creative industries in London, uh, in the UK, um, is a huge section of the economy. 56 billion um, pounds are contribute annually in the UK economy. In London, one in six jobs is in the creative industries. Um, and every year, 30,000 graduates from art and design colleges leave London colleges every year. And artists and makers sit within the creative industries as a really important part that need protecting within it. And so off the back of that, um, the Creative Land Trust um, was devised uh, by those founding um, partners. So we're an independent charity. We were set up in 2019 with the purpose to secure permanent workspaces across London and hopefully in future outside of London as well in other cities to provide truly affordable workspace for the, um, the sector to be run by studio providers, of which there is a huge um, number in London already, about over 150. So our model is essentially to fundraise and acquire with that those uh, funds properties um, all over London, to start with at least. These are then let to studio providers who are expert in the field at running studios, who in turn rents the studios to artists at, at very affordable rates. And this will hopefully allow for existing creative hubs, but also new creative hubs to pop up around London. And the figures there on the slide that um, with that range of 11 to 19 pounds per square foot per annum, that's the range that the workspace study um, surveyed across London, what artists can really truly afford per, per year. And really, the, the average is around 14 pounds, 30 or so. But, um, but essentially, artists, it's, it seems that they can't pay any more than 19 pounds a square foot. So it's our mission to provide space that won't be any more um, than that. Um, and I'll come to our two live projects in a second. But essentially, we're, we're looking across the whole of London. And there are areas of opportunity. Um, for instance, the mayor's uh, creative enterprise zones, which are you know, really interesting places where there could be uh, opportunities to bring new studios and, and protect studios that are already there. But also there's, there's places of need, both areas where there aren't so many artist studios, where hopefully we can bring, bring more into the um, community. Um, and likewise, uh, spaces where there are plenty of studios, but they're at risk and we want to try and protect those spaces. Um, so on to our first site. So we're really pleased um, at uh, last year to be able to announce our first acquisition. So our founding uh, funders were able to give us some money, um, some seed funding. And with that money, we went out and looked for um, an appropriate um, site. And Hackney Wick is one of those spaces that some may know. Um, historically, over the last 20 years, has had the densest population of artists, potentially even in Europe. Um, and that's at threat with this kind of development going on in, in the local area. And this building um, on Wallace Road is being developed by Telford Homes. Um, and uh, it replaced studios that were run by cell studios, studio providers, um, on the original site, which was a kind of light industrial warehouse. And there was a planning condition that required the developer to reprovide the 33,000 square feet of, um, of workspace for artists. Um, and so that's the spaces that we've bought. So whereas previously you might have um, high, high street um, coffee chains going into the ground floor of these units, we're going to uh, be putting studios into the lower ground and ground floor. Um, we've brought Cell Studios back into the picture, so they are going to be one of our studio providers because we felt it was really important to create that continuity and, and be trying to bridge with the, the, the local community. Um, 
and we're in the process of doing the fit out. So hopefully, come the summer, we'll have working studios, um, which we'll be able to announce. Our second site is just oh, is flicking it through. That's it. Our second site is just um, across the borough border in Newham. Alice Billings House is a site we've taken on. It, um, uh, it's owned by Newham Council, and we've taken on a lease. So Newham is our our landlords. Um, the the building itself is split into two parts, two blocks mirroring uh, buildings, and it's been sitting empty for the last approximately 15 years, um, with holes in the roof and pigeon, pigeons as inhabitants. Um, and it sits just behind Stratford Town Hall. And uh, through a tender process, we, we put forward a bid that would turn these um, rooms, which were previously dormitories for the old fire stations, firefighters, when West Ham Fire Station was just adjacent, uh, yeah, into studios for, for artists in the local area. And at the ground floor, there's also the potential for a kind of event space come exhibition and cafe space, which will allow a real interface for the local new population uh, to come and sort of experience what's happening in the building, but also for the tenants in, in, in the building to come down and, and have a kind of meeting space. Um, again, th this is, this, this is a, a massive refurbishment project, and, and we, we're, we're fundraising to get this building back up and running. Uh, but we've got the money to get the first phase of work um, the first phase happening, which will get all of the studios up and active. Um, and the first part of that is a kind of meanwhile use in one of the buildings, which will hopefully get about 15 to 20 artists working in there by the summer. So we're set up. Um, we had some initial funding that allowed us to uh, acquire our first property. But over time, we were looking at creating a blended finance model. So to begin with, and with our case studies that we're uh, trying to get up and running, we will be going out for don donations and, and getting grant money in to get those things live. Once we've got the two buildings up and running, and as the portfolio starts to build out, we'll be looking at other sources of funding. Um, so potential investment from impact, um, social impact investors uh, is one way where they expect a kind of patient return over many, many years uh, because of the very small returns we'll be able to provide. Um, and of course, there'll be a small marginal operating surplus that comes from, from running the buildings. But also, we look at strategic partnerships. Um, and so, for instance, our partnership with uh, Newham, who are, of course, our landlord, but um, have a shared set of values, is a really interesting way of trying to kind of garner interest and get more people engaged. Um, and we also will be working at um, uh, uh, policy work and trying to influence through campaigning and getting uh, developers and investors really interested in understanding the real benefit of having a creative workspace in their locality. And one of these projects is uh, one of the ways we do this is through re uh, commissioning research. This piece of research uh, was published in September. 2021 by Hawkins Brown and Data Loft. And what we wanted here was to put a real solid um, value on the um, presence of creative workspaces in new developments. And so we asked the researchers to uh, look at different creative clusters across London, but also in the Thames estuary. Uh, and through that research and across a period of 10 years, they were able to deduce that on average, the inclusion of workspaces in, in new developments will make the value of the actual residential properties go up by 4.4% approximately on uh, average per year. Um, so that's really helpful when we're speaking to developers to go creative workspace isn't just um, useful to, to make an area feel, feel good. It actually has a, a tangible result to it, too. But also, as tenants and as neighbors, um, creative workspaces are, are great for the local community. Our work obviously won't just um, 
focus on the financial benefit. We're really interested in what the social impact is of, of workspaces in the city. And so with our buildings, we'll be looking to measure the impact of um, the spaces. So from anything from the financial stability that they bring to the artist tenants through having a permanent workspace right through to the access that's provided to the local community and potential engagement and opportunities to learn um, about uh, about art making and the art, the art, uh, and art production. So that that's a kind of summary of of, of what we are and, and what we do. Um, essentially, this sort of cycle of trying to um, bring buildings up and running, get them working, and then fundraising and um, with through the campaigning, actually getting people um, interested, so that we can we can put more money back into the portfolio and build it further across London, and as I said, hopefully in the years to come across the UK. Thank you. Yeah, great. Well, thanks both. I think really complimentary presentations covering completely different aspects of the same type of thing from money and how we make that work to how these spaces are, are lovely to inhabit and the different ways in which they might be inhabited. What I am thinking of, though, as I'm hearing from you both, is there's this background picture of threat to studios in the city. And I think that's borne out by the studies that we've undertaken as well, um, which showed actually in 2014, around 28% of the studios that we had information about were not expecting to be able to renew their leases within five years. Like thirty percent of the studios are somehow threatened, which is a difficult environment to be practicing in and kind of destabilizing, I imagine. Um, that had actually decreased in 2017 to the figure that you referenced, which is that seventeen percent at risk within five years. Still not great though, if we're being honest. Seventeen percent is still quite a lot. And as I say, we're in the process of updating the study now, so we're interested to see what the picture of that um, looks like currently, because of this just threat everywhere you look right now. <laughs> so, so this is kind of a difficult situation to be operating in. And I'm wondering, and this is a kind of deliberately provocative, and Astrid, I'm going to come to you first, but I think it will be interesting to hear from both of you. In that context of threat, do artists really care about architecture or what the kind of space is like, or is it all about price? Is that the main driver for what we're looking at? I know, you know, it's not an either-or situation, but just as a kind of provocation, does price drive everything with artist studios? What are the other things that we need to be thinking about? Astrid, I'm really interested to hear from you. Um, well, I mean, you'd have to ask the artists, but from what we've heard from them, they have said that they, they do find particularly certain arrangements and I'm not necessarily talking about whether things look nice or not, but particular arrangements being really valuable to them. And the example of the five square meter studio that can open out into a 40 square meter studio, that's, that's a specific person who said that she's really grateful that that was possible because that was all that she could afford, but it meant that she could work on a bigger scale. And um, that's for me is as much part of the architecture as the the appearance and uh, so I think there's there's the element of the the, the design and the, and the quality and wanting to have good quality public spaces there's the functionality and being able to adapt your spaces and make them fit your needs um, and that's all part of the architecture as well um, which might be very cheap. In fact, sometimes making those decisions might actually be cheaper than the, the sort of standard fit out. And uh, it's just about making those decisions with a certain kind of adaptability in mind because all artists have different needs. So um, I'd say it's it, it is important. It just depends which which part different parts will be different, differently sort of valued. I think it's a great answer. And actually, I think the, project, the projects really demonstrate how 
those things that are inherent within each other that actually both, you know, they can, they can be complementary, not that one kind of dominates over the other evil. I don't know. Your position. I think the flexibility point seems to be really important because artist practice does change over time and their needs will change. So, you know, we're, we're, all, we're constantly, with the fit outs that we're looking at at the moment, looking at a very light touch approach because that is the cheapest way to do it, but it's also the best way because that blank canvas then allows for the tenants to go in and uh, the artists to sort of use the space as, as, as well as they want. But clearly there are certain things that you need to provide and you need to have safe spaces that are secure, dry spaces, lit spaces and, and warm spaces if you can. And, you know, often studios are not the warmest of places. So how can we do that and make really sustainable but light touch um, approach um, spaces that um, provide a, cater for a, a, a variety of different needs um, uh, and, and types of practice. I think this question about the quality of environment in a lot of existing artist studios is almost makes me feel more positive about this kind of churn that we're seeing in the evidence that actually quite a lot of studios are being lost but then they're being reprovided and we hope that the reprovision whilst it's destabilizing in that process can be for better environmental performance better kind of thermal performance all of these things um yeah it's really interesting one of the other things that i was kind of refreshing my memory of in preparing for this was it's a bit of a kind of haggard old quote now. But I looked it up, it's from 1987, so nearly as old as I am. This quote about artists being the shock troops of gentrification, mm. which we hear, I think, again and again. It's like the first casualties of war, of gentrification in the city. So they're kind of going in there when prices are cheap. They're making somewhere really desirable. The prices rise, they get kicked out. There's this kind of recurring pattern. I think we're still slightly suckers for it this sort of sense that bringing artists in will be optimistic and like we're an up and coming place. And I wonder, again, coming to you, Astrid, if your reflection on that in relation to Barking and Dagenham, yeah. is it because they're for the love of creative endeavor or is it bringing in this sort of magic fairy dust that artists bring to areas of regeneration of which Barking and Dagenham is obviously one? And then how do we feel about that? Because in the model that is being put forward and in the kinds of developments Eve, that you're talking about, actually the studio space is kind of embedded in that new development. So it's less at threat. And have we finally found that right balance of bringing in artists as a sort of driver of regeneration and change in the city in a way that doesn't then mean that they also get pushed out afterwards? Query. So, <laughs> yeah, no, there's a, a few topics in there. Yeah. And I think... Um, I've, I suppose I've always had a problem with laying any blame at artists' feet for gentrification because they are victims of the system that's also m making it difficult for many other people to live uh, in the city or stay in the city. So um, there's a problem with the over-financialization of land and property. And so in terms of what's a good way of bringing artists into an area and what's a less good way. I mean, there's, I think every project we've done has had a, a public component and uh, has involved people who live locally. Um, so with the library that, that was built with a lot of local volunteers, so there was involvement throughout the whole process. Um, so it was something that was expected, built on together, and is used in part by the public. So I suppose that's a way of connecting it to, to an area that's, so it's not entirely alien. Um, and then I guess the last part is whether, you know, are they the shock troops that then move on? And that's, that all depends on the policy and how, how strictly it's maintained by the council, you know, mm. keeping things in perpetuity and making sure that, uh, I mean, in house for artists, they're not subject to a uh, right to buy. So, and Darren Rodwell from the council does believe strongly in the project. So there are people 
the council is supporting it very strongly, so um, that should be protected in perpetuity. It's interesting though then, Eve, because you're coming from a, a direction of engagement with private sector investment really, rather than being completely supported by councils, although there's public sector kind of backing for you. So is that important in this long-term security of artists' workspace in the city? Yeah, I think, I, think the, I think the narrative is starting to change. Developers are realizing, property sector is realizing that to make a holistic community that really works, you have to have a balance. And it's not just about packing as many um, new um, apartments into space and then leaving the sort of street empty. It's about a real mixture. Um, and that's possible, you know, you can make the, the, the books balance if you bring it in to the thinking very early on at pre-planning stage and you involve the artist community and the local community in those um, discussions to say, you know, what is it you actually really need so that you can engineer the spaces to get that flexibility that we were speaking about earlier um, and inevitably keep the costs down so that everything kind of just fits. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I think I think getting the perpetuity in there is is really important. If if you can hold on to the spaces, and create a stable place for um, artists that aren't going to have to then move on in five years' time, then people grow roots and they start um, shopping at the local hardware store and um, meeting at the local community center or in the cafe in the the building next door, and like like any other sort of small business, you start to um, interact with the neighborhood or you're already there and you're then using this as a local facility. So I think that's really crucial, is that kind of localized um, approach. I think it's really interesting. And this model of including artist workspace as part of a bigger mixed use development, clearly there are architects who are incredibly skilled at designing this kind of space. But are you worried? that there are a lot of people who don't understand that. So I was really interested to hear about your consideration of privacy, of how the spaces work, that like this is a space where you can store some stuff and then you've got a smooth wall as well, or you can drill into these walls any way you like. This is quite fine grain level of understanding about how those spaces are gonna be occupied. Are we asking too much of generic mixed use development architect A, X? Um, no, <laughs> I think that's uh, the level of consideration that should be given to every building. Um, and I think there's, I mean, I suppose one thing we wanted to do was pro provide an, or, you know, we wanted to build an example that we thought could be, uh, have ideas within it that, um, isn't just about artists, but is contains things that are useful to everyone. I mean, everyone might have wanted to hang up some shelves in the past and then find they have like a crumbly plasterboard wall and they can't do it. And I mean, these are just considerations that it's fair for everyone to um, <laughs> be able to drill into a wall. Um, everyone can use adaptability. Um, people, it's important to have some slack in a plan, like some things you can change, that if your circumstances change, that you, your apartment can change with you, that you don't necessarily then have to move. Um, and usually that kind of adaptability only comes if you own a home with a, a ground floor, a, a house, that's, that's when you can extend. And I mean, another part of, the model is that um, if two adjacent appointment apartments agree, they can switch one room to belonging to the other apartment. So there's the switch room. So you can actually extend and contract as well. And I think it's fair to think about these things with every kind of uh, affordable housing building is um, what do people want and need and how can we try to do the best we possibly can and that applies to all architects. Mm. I think it's fair enough. <laughs> I'm wondering also just this dynamic between kind of pricing and accommodation. 
and it's really interesting to me that the house for artists is housing as well as artist studio provision and I think one of the things that we're hearing again and again and it kind of keeps coming up this dynamic with affordability not just of the studio space itself which obviously mm. Creative Land Trust is trying to protect but the affordability of housing as well and how that plays into the space that there is for artists in in London let's put it on London and just say how challenging that is. And I wonder if there's more to say, I mean, perhaps even from your perspective on how that dynamic works and whether that changes where you might be looking at your studios or, yeah, how, how do we tackle that? Yeah, I mean, it, it won't work if we've got um, a whole population of artists commuting into London to use their studios. It just won't, that's not gonna work. So there has to be um, a way of, of creating more space through, th through affordable housing. Um, we haven't yet quite got around to cracking that um, at the moment, but maybe, you know, watch the space in a few <laughs> years. So we'll try and do the workspace thing first. Um, but yeah, I think uh, there needs to be a, a dialogue because at the end of the day, a lot of artists are on very lumpy sal salaries or wages where, uh, they might have an exhibition, um, uh, and then you know there's a there's a flurry of work that comes in from that, um, and then there's a kind of period of of of, of less of that, and so it's very difficult to understand where your income is going to be and for how long. So you know that we haven't got the the solution for it yet, but at least at least with the 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 rents of the workspace, hopefully we can get to a space where people still feel that they can be in London. And I think artists do want to be in London. There are, some, there are a lot of people who are moving to Margate and to, we hear stories about people moving to Dublin, to, to Lisbon and other, other, other global cities where the, things are cheaper. Um, but the galleries are all in London at the moment still. And so there's a dialogue there that needs to happen. And I think, I think there will always be a place for um, uh, artists in, in the city. Um, we just have to crack exactly how to help them do that. Stay, how do you help them stay? I think Astrid knows. <laughs> you, have some, you have an idea. <laughs> On provision of affordable housing? Or? Well, the, the house for artists is such an interesting model, isn't it? And so unusual and yeah. idiosyncratic. And I wonder if you see that there's potential to roll it out or you know, how, how that extrapolates for you. Or is it always this sort of beautiful, slightly unusual example? So um, I think, I mean, then this particular model it's tied to the the rents are tied to um, the public program that the artists provide. So there's an element of exchange, and that's still being defined, and will be defined over the next two years. For exactly what that means, um, exactly how much time, exactly what kind of program. So, um, but I think it's. It is it is possible to roll that model out. I think it's it it's possible to roll it out without having a form of exchange as well, um, and that's all down to how things are financed. And um, it's with the right kind of interest rates on loans, for example, you can have buildings that pay for themselves on very low rents. Um, and I think we just have to stop tying rents to market rate because market rate doesn't mean anything. It's completely arbitrary. Things should be tied, if anything, to um, what things cost to build. And if you can make buildings pay for themselves through a low rent, then there should be absolutely nothing stopping us building lots of good affordable housing. But there's a persistence of this idea of market rate um, being a, a valuable measure. And as long as we do that, then yeah, we can talk about 80% or 65%. It's like 85% 80 isn't necessarily affordable. So I think that's a measure that we just have to drop. Agreed. I like it. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's other countries that already do that. Like, it's already like in Switzerland. You talk of at cost rent, and that means the rent is just what it costs to build, what it costs to maintain the building. That's it. And to me, that kind of makes sense because that covers itself. You can't even talk of subsidies. But 
It's not subsidised. And then you don't have this challenge of who's that, who's eligible for that, which I think yeah. is yeah. There's part there's of no it. stigma, and I think stigma comes from the idea that social housing is in some way subsidised, um, when the reality is that a lot of social housing isn't in any way subsidised. You're you're only foregoing a massive profit, which isn't the same as the subsidy. So it's not costing anyone anything. You're just foregoing an extra chunk of cash on top, but it, it's still covering itself. So. You did have the answer. I knew that <laughs> yes, you would, and you did. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> what it's making me... I'm just going gonna, gonna to ask one more question. It's just kind of for myself, really, and then I think it'll be interesting to hear from the audience, so get your questions ready, please. Um, I couldn't do a talk without talking a little bit about high streets. And it hasn't come up so much so far, but it's interesting looking at artist studio providers' websites of what they're offering at the moment. There's the sort of typology of the artist studios in the bottom of a mixed-use block. There's the typology of kind of relatively old industrial sheds. And more and more, there's <coughs> bits of high streets that we've been able to get our hands on, where this question of what the market will pay for it is all kind of fallen away because of COVID, and suddenly the whole retail portfolio is like, oh my God, it's not, we're not, worth what, not worth what we thought it was. And so this kind of space is becoming available. We have this issue of vacancy and sort of excessive space in some ways in some high streets and town centres, not all of them. And then a need for space on the side of studios and, and artists. And that seems to be a really happy coming together in a lot of ways. And I was wondering if we learn anything from your respective kind of views and perspectives and project experience on how fruitful that relationship might be between the provision of artist studios and empty space on high streets. Mm. Eve, I'm going to come to you first. Yeah, and, and I guess I can, I can speak to it um, through the, the second project that I mentioned, the Alice Billings House um, site. Uh, which is kind of on a high street. It's, it's slightly hidden away because it's behind the town hall uh, and actually behind gates often. But um, it very much sits um, on a high street, the Broadway, which is Stratford's high street. And Strat Stratford High Street itself is, um, I guess you could say it is forgotten because you've got the Olympic Park, which had a huge amount of investment that went into it um, back in 2012 and just prior to it. And Stratford High Street it just hasn't had the same focus. And so I think the council has been really thinking through how to best serve the community there. And our, our proposal to turn um, Alice Billings House into 26 or 30 studios is a kind of kernel into, into what we think can happen there. Because through a culture-led uh, regeneration, you could potentially see um, First, in the, the absolute proximity where there are two other buildings that are owned by the council that aren't um, being used in their fullest potential, that could be spillover space if this project is really successful. And then there's the whole of the high street. And as you say, the, the, there's, retail is changing. And, and where I think developers and property owners thought that retail was a sure, f sure fix for an income, that's falling away a bit at the moment. And people are a bit uncertain about the future of that. And in its place is coming workspace, and creative workspace is very much a part of that, especially because creative workspace does something different to what co-working does, in that it um, it has a kind of much more animated, productive feel to it. There's sort of engagement that's happening. You know, if you could imagine that um, at, in a kind of a shop window, um, and the idea of, of, of a shop actually having a kind of workshop at the back of it. So you, could, you, you can really see um, new activations uh, that could, could start happening over the next few years. And I think it's a really exciting time. There's a lot of opportunity. We don't know how long it'll last. And that, that it goes back to that idea of the precariousness of, 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 of um, the sector. How do, we, how do we build in the perpetuity to make sure that these opportunities that um, are arising at the moment aren't just a flash in the pan thing? And then in five years' time, when the economy changes again, um, the, the creative space is swept away because something else is coming in that's more lucrative. So how do we create that perpetuity? And, and, and you know, is the, are there are there new models of ownership that allow for that to make sure that those spaces are held on to? Um, but yeah, it, generally at the moment there is a there's a sort of there's a there's a swelling of of 
optimism, my kind of touching word, just hoping that it'll continue. <laughs> yeah, I think historically a lot of, let's say, good times for artists have been where there has been a, an abundance of space through uh, some mechanism that, that maybe uh, deindustrialized cities have had, uh, industrial, industrial buildings that have become vacant and cheap, and or well, there have been squats, uh, or ways to live and work cheaply, which just hasn't been the case for a long time in London. And I think when changes happen, that can be uh, a useful thing for artists. I guess we're not there yet. Yeah. It's because I think yeah, a lot of the individual landlords are holding out for uh, getting a decent rent in. So uh, we have to see how that progresses and you know, what other kind of models of um, studio management there are when it's lots of small landlords potentially with small shops. Um, Mm. or full department stores that could turned into studios, we'll, we'll see. Mm. I know of a few of those. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I think there is a narrative, there is a, there's, a, there's a conversation to be had with those property owners to make them see the value. Um, uh, and it, it's, there is a, there's a shift happening at the moment. Some, some people are, are immediately jumping onto it and you know, you've got a lot of examples of meanwhile opportunities where that's coming up. But yeah, I think, at, over the next couple of years, you're going to see a lot of people trying to experiment um, with these different shapes of space. The um, yeah, the, the department store is going to be quite an interesting one to see where, where that goes. So a few challenges in front of us. I think it's so. Hyper Studios are an interesting example of meanwhile space on high streets, aren't they? And this this kind of model of I guess not pepper potted, but scattered smaller yeah. spaces is a completely different model than the kind of typical Acme or Akava or whoever. Yeah. big artist studio provider type of thing. So it's interesting to see people testing that. And then the department store is a whole other thing yet again. We're yet to see, I think, a whole one taken over just as artist studios. I mean, <laughs> ah, nice. Um, let's come to the audience then, if that's OK. Can we have a first, come on, a volunteer, a shock troop of? <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Hello, thank you for your presentation. Um, I was wondering if maybe there's perhaps a bit of a contradiction in, on one hand, acknowledging the need for um, cheap housing or um, more affordable housing, but also recognizing that these new artist studios are increasing the value of neighboring properties by 4.4%. Do you want to? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's my slide. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I, we need both. We need, we, need the, we need the affordable housing and we need the affordable workspace. And um, artist studios, um, creative workspace isn't going to solve the capitalism problem. Um, artists need the affordable workspace. Um, and so we're trying to tackle that. But there's no doubt that we need to make sure that the communities that are living in the sp in in those localities are looked after as well, and policy needs to be able to be strong enough to solve that problem or, or help solve that problem. Um, we hope that the work we're doing is also showing the the other side that isn't just that financial value that the 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 social value is really ingrained into what we're doing, and it's really important that you're not we're not kind of helicoptering things in, that what's happening is reflective of what the community really wants and needs. And that the tenant base, the artists are, are from the local area, or as many of them as, as possible, so that the proportion of, of people in the spaces are reflective of the demographic of, 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 the, of the population around. So I don't know what the answer is, but, um, but we're, we're sort of working towards something step by step. I think it's a really good point, though, because I think a lot of the time when you're working on these projects, there'll be some people that are really committed to the idea and uh, see an inherent value in um, community space or art space. And then there are others that you might come across in the same project that don't understand why you're doing it. Like, what's the point of artists or what's the point of community space? And that's where uh, it sometimes you need statistics to sort of prove your case of why art 
has a value. And that's where um, reports like the one Holly worked on, or I mean, I didn't know the statistic, but statistics like that, that's when you can speak to people from a completely different mindset where you can uh, somehow explain like we, we referred to the report when we had to explain to people that artists actually uh, were in financial need because then we could say, well, here's a report that says they only earn uh, 10K a year. And then people had never even thought about the idea that artists um, are poor or that they might need social housing. So I think that's where it helps to have uh, used data in a context where people aren't necessarily agreeing with you. Um, but yeah, there are always complex contradictions. I think, I think it's, a really, it's an interesting question, though, isn't it? I think it demonstrates the quandary of the whole system. Yeah, yeah but probably too much to expect us to solve it tonight. Yes, there's a question at the, right at the back, and then we'll come down to the front. Um, oh, is, it? is it on? Oh, yeah. Um, this is for um, Eve at first. Um, as part of your research of like where to put these studios, um, you might have already factored this in, but um, a lot of artists, especially in my studio, they half of them live on boats, and we were literally discussing what okay if we were going to move studios, where we were going to, um, and you know my friend, we're, I'm moving with, we're gonna have to move somewhere that connects to like the Lee Bridge um, station line because then it goes up where she's likely to live. And I was just wondering if, as part of you know factoring in where you're going to make you know plans to make studios in the future, you might think about researching where artists are likely to move to, or where they you know because I I know we're linking affordability and in you know future ideal world, but. You know, I think it would be a good part of research if you're not already considering it to say, you know, where are you going to move to next? Because, you know, for example, Hackney, lots of people live there. I'm about to move out to Tottenham. And, you know, like, planning that trajectory and then saying, OK, to meet the artist there, because obviously everything takes time. I just wondered if you considered that. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a balance. We need to we, we, we need to populate the areas like Hackney where there are studios being lost at a rapid rate. And, you know, we've we've gone to Hackney Wick as a sort of first stop, as a kind of trying to sort of put a line in the sand for that attrition um, of studio spaces. But you're right; there are other areas where we can. There's a real opportunity because maybe the prices haven't quite gone up in the same way. And so there, you could get more space generally, and 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 sort of spread out a little bit more, and, and get more 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 units, more studio units. Um, we're, we're looking at every borough at the moment. I mean, uh, COVID had a, a bit of a, an impact because we could only go as far as our bike ride would allow us to go um, during the time that we were looking at spaces. But now that that the restrictions are over, we're we're, we're looking as far afield as we can. And at the moment, we're in a kind of um, consolidation period where, where we're, we're looking at the next round of funding. But we are looking at the pipeline for um, the next studios um, for 2023, 2024, so, and beyond. So thinking about where next is really, is really important in that, in that arc. I think it's also interesting to think that there's a sort of um, natural movement which you can plot from whatever, Clerkenwell way back in the day to Hackney, to Hackney Wick, maybe towards Tottenham. And I remember having a conversation with a client in 2005, I think, in Tottenham, like, and when artists come here, then we'll know that we're doing the right thing. Like, this will be great when artists come to Tottenham. And back then you're like, oh, wow, that is a long way off for me. But, but it happened. And then the, the kind of contrast with what's happening in Barking and Dagenham, which is actually the previous, the 2014 study had, I think, almost no artist studios in Barking and Dagenham. And then it's a sort of artificial, uh, engineered pull of artists to somewhere to drive the kind of change that they want to see. So there is a sort of, the, you describe the sort of waves, I think, of, of artists kind of flowing out of places and that kind of more gradual p picture of change versus maybe something which is slightly more constructed or deliberate in Barking and Dagenham. The, I mean, the Creative Land Trust could be in both of those places just as legitimately. Totally. Yeah. 
We could, we could also be on boats, though. I'm quite interested Ooh, yeah, in that idea. <laughs> is the studio, is it just a work, is it just a live space, or do you actually make art on your boat? Because I'm into that idea. <laughs> I was saying that people who rent in my studio space yeah. live on boats. Yeah, okay. But, but I was also thinking that, you know, as part of the research, you know, if you were going to look into if artists need, you know, social housing and things like that. The fact that lots of them do live on boats, I don't know if that's, you know, actually researched and written down because they, you know, can only afford to be artists because of that, you know, very distinct way of living. It's really, it's really interesting. I, I, I imagine somebody's thought about it, but I hadn't really thought about the boating community as, a, as, as some, somewhere where we should look and, and, and capture the data as well. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting point. There was a question at the front, and then we'll come to this one up here, if that's OK. Hi, um, I just have a thought based on the first question, which was about the artists and gentrification and your first project, I forget where it was, but I wonder if that's kind of sort of, except sort of maintaining the draw of the area after the fact where it's attached to a development and so that, in my mind, if there's a development and that shift has already started to happen and so it's kind of holding on to the draw of the area or maybe, like you said, pulling it, engineering it. I'm sorry, I forget where it was, but my main question was, on your slide about how the Creative Land Trust works, there was an arrow and it said partnerships with developers, um, local authorities and communities. And I suppose actually artists are like a fourth factor in that as a community. And I'm wondering, does the Creative Land Trust um, put some limits on where the relative levels of input are between those three groups? Because sort of in order, in my mind, that's where the power sort of decreases. Mm. And I wonder if you act to, mm. to reverse that. Um, I think they, um, they inter we interact with them in different ways. So artists are at the core of everything we do. Like that's the raison d'etre, is to make sure that artists are looked after and we don't lose them uh, indefinitely to other places, although great for other places if they move to other places. Um, so th that's always at the sort of core of, of what we do and, you know, the idea of, of, of making sure that the rents are kind of, we work backwards always from what the artists really can pay. But we're always hoping to go back to the artists and sort of make sure that we're, we're, not, we're not getting slippage and we're, we're not sort of falling away from our mission. Um, and then the community, second, secondary, the sort of more local community, the community at large is crucial as well because you want to make sure that you're not just a sort of sore thumb in, in, in a space, that you're actually doing something that's relevant. So, so with that information, you then kind of, you, you can then go and present to X developer, Y property owner, and Z local authority. And that's how, that, that's in Newham anyway, that's, that's how we worked, is that we, um, we approached Newham after the kind of information that we had from the community. Is part of your role mediating the tension between the three groups almost? Because um, I can see that, for example, the community mm. would be averse to whatever a developer wants to do. I suppose we act as a, a bit of a bridge, sort of a, trans, a translator of different kinds of ways of thinking. It's not our necessarily our role. I don't, I don't think we see it as our role to be the kind of voice of one or the other. Um, but yeah, certainly when we're speaking to developers, it's sort of it, there's, there's a kind of translating, trying to sort of gain trust, you know, sort of make, making people see that everyone is just sort of working towards a common goal. They're just coming from it in different ways. And I think one point about House for Artists, about at least half the artists are actually from the area or very close. So I think there's, it's a bit of a mix because some actually went away from Barking in, as part of their practice and then came back. So if that's a pull factor pulling people back to where they were originally from or if people that you know, have always been based there. Um, so sometimes the artists in the community are one and the same. It's, and it's, it's not always an, that these are two different entirely separate groups. There can be quite a, an overlap as well. Thanks. Um, there was another question up by the aisle over here. 
Hi. Um, so, it's, yeah, first of all, it's really interesting you saying about boats. I'm, um, I'm a designer myself. I'm my partner, who also, we both live on a boat on the River Lee, um, he's a, a successful painter and has worked has been hopping studios, yeah, for about, it's been about three studios in the last two years. Um, and we're always looking for planning permission, you know, how, how long has this building got, how long has this building got? And, um, but my, uh, but so I was just saying, um, but my uh, question is really about supporting spaces. So as well as, um, you mentioned it a little bit in the talks, but um, so make so artists have certain needs like painters, but also if if your make a maker space is very different. So things like kilns, shared facilities. Um, how important do you do you think that is, and how 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 do you think that works? And then on top of that, display spaces. So spaces you talked about window frontage and the ground floor of um, uh, properties, and that kind of is a very different space from the private almost like you don't want anyone to see actually work in progress space. Um, yeah, I wondered where you see that potential or whether actually that's something that shouldn't really be part of these schemes. Um, it should be something separate. Well, I think it has to go into the thinking, like, throughout. I mean, we, we, we're guided by the studio providers who are our tenants who run the spaces as to how they see the spaces best being fitted out. And that's what's happening in our, our site on Wallace Road. One of our studio providers is providing pure visual artist space. Granted, you seen you saw the the sort of computer rendering, it's big glazed windows. So it, these spaces were imagined as retail units. So we're kind of retrofitting into those. But there are artists who are happy to kind of you know put their work out there and have it have it on display. Um, but yeah, our other studio provider, who, who's a local studio provider, Technewick, they're providing maker space, so there'll be a mixture of different kinds of space. And I think you need, in this day and age, to provide a bit of everything. I mean, it'd be great to, to, um, to provide bespoke spaces, but you don't know who's necessarily going to take those spaces. So going back to that point around flexibility is really important, so that a tenant can bring in a kiln, but equally if they need to put up shelving to have um, have storage so that they can whack canvases up up high and, and be making paint, uh, painting pictures and uh, canvases at floor level that should be possible so uh, yeah a mixture I don't know it doesn't really answer the question maybe yeah, no, I mean in house for artists we we put in two different kinds of plug sockets so that heavy machinery could also be plugged in so that that was already built into the infrastructure or the things that are difficult to change. Um, and also try to make it possible that you know, extra sinks could be added, but it was sort of unknown who, who would be using space and what exactly they would need. So we just saw it as important to have some of the core infrastructure there so that it was possible later if, if it's needed. I just have a small bit to add on this, actually, because um, I mentioned that we we're in the process of updating the, the previous 2014-2017 studies. And part of the update that we're currently working on is much broader, looking at different types of cultural infrastructure as well, including makerspace as a sort of separate subset of creative workspace. And from what we can see from the desk-based research so far, which is still to be supplemented by a wider survey that gives us more detail, so it's still kind of preliminary, but it looks like the impact on that kind of space of COVID has been more significant than it has on artist workspace more generally. And I think we can kind of understand why that would be because that's shared facilities and like being in your own artist studio, it's kind of safer and probably more necessary to get out of your house um, than just desk-based sort of professional services work. But the makerspace impact looks like that's been more significant. So maybe there's more work to be done on that. And maybe that's something to kind of factor into forward planning on the sorts of space that we're looking to secure and kind of take more care of going forward. Um, but like I say, all very preliminary. But right now, it looks like actually there's a, a greater loss in that sector as opposed to artist studios, um, as mapped previously. I think it's important, though, that artist studios really are protected, though, because they are, it goes back to that income thing of, of, of a precarious income some, sometimes with an artist versus a maker who might have a more steady income. So making sure that those, those artist spaces really, they are prevalent and that they are protected so that we don't 
if there is a loss, that um, at least there's a core of those that are kept held on to. So I'm getting a wave. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm a question. <laughs> oh, a oh. question. Oh, I thought it was like, get it off, get it off. <laughs> no, no, I'm, um, <laughs> thank you. It's, it's been such a brilliant discussion. Um, you've talked a lot about London and East London in particular, and I just wonder, are there other national or international places that you're looking to um, that, that have alternative models? So, Astrid, you talked a little bit about Switzerland, but are there other countries or, or other cities that you think have have interesting models. And I, I guess with that in mind as well, how exceptional do you think East London is? Is it a useful example for others to, to compare their provision with? Interesting. So, you know, we, um, we have looked at a lot at Switzerland, um, uh, but I don't know if they have the answers on studio space. I think they, they're they quite progressive on their provision of affordable housing. Um, and I think studio space is a, a work in progress there as, as much as here. So um, uh, as I think a lot of uh, industrial buildings have been demolished there, so uh, the available space is diminished massively. and. I think probably similar discussions have to be had there. So that's that's all I know about Switzerland specifically. I don't know if you've... Um, the, uh, in San Francisco, the Creative Land Trust is partly based on an organization called CAST, the Community Arts Stabilization Trust in San Francisco. San Francisco has gone through a huge... We talk about sort of the um, gentrification issue in London. Well. San Francisco with Silicon Valley has had that kind of a really condensed and rapid rate. And, and CAST looks at um, cultural venues that need to be protected. So they, they, the, the organization buys up the property and then puts in an operator. Um, and the operator, over a space of about a decade, buys the building at that original price off the trust. And so hopefully with that model, they pr proliferate. Um, across other buildings, other cultural venues around um, around the city, um, we also know of an organisation in Toronto called Artscape, who've been going for almost thirty years now, who, who provide workspace um, for the city and, and, and for artists specifically. Um, so th those are two main models, but we, there are lots of conversations, especially the Greater London Authority. They're doing a lot of work with. Um, um, I've forgotten the name of the f uh, uh, cultural f uh, world forum, cultural world forum, or something. It's called. Do you know it? Mm -hmm. Not sure. It's going to. It's going to come to me in a minute. Anyway, and so so it's linking uh, world cities, global cities, um, who are dealing with um, uh, issues around space, essentially space as in urban space, um, and the cultural kind of um, uh, offer within that. And, and that goes around the world. So there's the, they, they, they do regular um, seminars with uh, different cities around the world. So there's a network out there of really interesting resources. Um, and not to plug our website necessarily, but we've got a lot of resources on our website. If anybody's interested, I can share a link later for everybody. Uh, we've got quite a bit on there. Great. Oh, well, there's still more questions. Can we take one more? One, I'm allowed one. Uh, you already had one, I'm afraid, so we're going to go to at the back. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm interested in um, the idea of the finance to make these spaces. Um, and the question I had is regarding financial uh, independence. I'm interested to understand that so far the model of the Creative Land Trust is based on external input of money and therefore a financial dependence to fulfill your mission. I'm interested to know, are you not worried that this might dry out and therefore you cannot fulfill this, this uh, purpose? And if you are, what are you creating in order to not be dependent on them? Thanks. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, we're hoping that the model will become self-sustaining over time. At the moment, it's not because we have to prove that the model works. And to do that, you've got to have a working example that you can kind of point to. 
um, and go look what we've done and look look what it does and look how look how um, look how it helps um, the people in, in in the building and and the community at large and the cultural se sector generally. Um, and with that, we'll be able to hopefully bring in outside investment and actually start to make the thing um, not be reliant on donated money. But there will always be a, a bit of a blended form to it. Um, but hopefully over time, it will mean that we'll become less and less dependent on that. Um, and it becomes a bit more sort of um, rolling. Um, but we've, we, we've got a little bit of, way, of a way to go yet. But there is an this kind of slightly relates to the previous question actually as well, which in terms of examples from elsewhere, um, so Folkestone where we've been doing a bit of work has a really interesting model which I don't think is replicable because you have to have a tame billionaire yeah. to make it work, but um, they do have one. Mm. Uh, so a gentleman called Roger Dehan who owned Saga, anyway, wealthy guy, very committed to Folkestone and kind of future of Folkestone has bought up basically the whole of the old high street and is then leasing that at, well endows it to a trust which then operates it leasing it at affordable levels to creative practitioners both on the high street kind of the sort of consumption facing shop front type of arrangement as well as back of house production spaces um, but the trust then is self-sustaining because of the endowment of the asset so that like I say, not easily repl replicable, but it gives us hope that models like yours can work mm. with enough of a sort of portfolio of properties that you're able to manage and take even modest rents from. Still, yeah, if you have a spare billionaire, it'll be fine, it'll really, then you can do some really good stuff. But it just is interesting how other people kind of arrange things to make change and the impact, the sort of bigger urban impact of that mm. action in Folkestone is really, Kind of meaningful and significant, not without challenges, but nonetheless, big urban change and sort of change of perceptions as well. I think of a of a whole town because of this yeah. action. I, th I think it's that conversation around trying to um, place the creative sector in, within the wider sector and and give it relevance. What you know, why invest in the arts? Why invest in in culture? Why invest in creative production? What are all the other things? If you if you took out all of the cultural venues in London, what would London look like? And if we can start having that conversation and think about the studio as the kind of research and development, the lab for the creative sector, then people will start going, oh, okay, so my cinema, you know, my trip to the cinema actually goes back to the studio. My trip to the museum goes back to the studio. Um, and. Um, just before coming in, I went around the show at Whitechapel Gallery here, and I, I was watching a video made by Space Studios in the 70s with Bridget Riley and another artist. And uh, they took on a massive building in East London um, back then. And they had to get Henry, I think it was Henry Moore. Is that possible? Was he around at that point? Could be. Henry Moore. Um, Let's as, say yes. As their patron. And because they said we, we needed we needed some financial help as for the first building you know that they took on, so way back in the sixties when we're talking about you know squatting buildings and and there being more space even then the arts needed a little bit of support to get going so hopefully we can we can make it self sustaining going forward. That's great. That sounds like a really beautiful note to end it on. So we just would like to say thank you very much, Astrid. Thank you, Eve. Thanks all of you. Thanks for your questions. Really good.